Lesson tonight will be presented by our pastor, Pastor Brown. Hear ye him. We reverence God and thank him for our being here this evening. And to our superintendent, Brother William Collins, thank you so much for opening us up and for the devotion on for all of you who are part of our study tonight. Again, this is lesson 10 for August 6, Inheriting the Kingdom. Thank you for the introduction. Galatians 5, chapter 5, verses 13 through 26. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, reveling, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying 
one another. So today we are in the Pauline epistle to the church at Galatia. This lesson is divided into three parts, living in freedom, which is chapter five of Galatians, verses 13 through 18, fulfilling God's law, verses 13 and 15, choosing God's side, verses 16 and 18. Second portion, rejecting selfishness, deadly lust, of the, or the deadly list, should I say, and I guess I could say lust too, but deadly list, verses 19 through 21b, deadly consequences, verse 21c. And finally, thirdly, pursuing godliness, which is Galatians 5, 22 through 26, a list of life, what fruit is this, and a list a life to live out, a list of life. And in verses 24 and 26, a life <coughs> to live out, excuse me. So Paul's letter to the Galatians uh, was addressed uh, to people who had some controversy going on. Controversy among churches, which we, he found as a result of the first missionary journey. He wrote in response to some people's belief that Christians or Gentiles' background had, a, had to obey stipulations in the law of Moses in order to become uh, belong to God's people. Paul pointed out that faith in Jesus not the completion of the works of law is the true identifier of God's people. God gave the Israelites the law of Moses to guide them until he brought the fulfillment of his promise. And the fulfillment of his promise was salvation through the Messiah. That fulfillment was Jesus. His death and resurrection made it possible for people of every nation to be welcomed into God's family. Works of law in general and circumcision in particular had not resulted in the people living as God called them to live, fully devoted to him in holiness. But in Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, there was freedom and empowerment to do so. So the first portion is fulfilling God's law. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. The nature of the controversy indicates the presence of brethren from both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. These dis disparate groups had been made into a family by God's call. That call is the good news that in Jesus, God had come in the flesh, had submitted to death, and rose to new life. The result of that was called liberty. He set us free. That term would have reminded Paul's Jewish readers of Israel's exodus from Egypt, making the end of their enslavement. The exodus began the journey to freedom in the, to the promised land, but best but beset by sinful disobedience generation after generation. Israel lived more under oppression than in true freedom. That state led eventually to exile and captivity in a foreign land. But th that exile and captivity wasn't the result of what God had given them. It was a result of their disobedience to God. And so they, instead of living liberated lives, 
live captive lives, a captive to the law, then a captive to the violation of the law and the, and the, and the a punishment that followed it. God promised that true freedom means an end to being exiled from his presence. In the gospel, the promise is fulfilled. Verse 13b says, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. But liberty is not license. Some might have thought that because the requirements of the law were fulfilled through Jesus, that their freedom meant that they could do as they please. Paul negated this thought using freedom to repeat the sinful rebellion that led to exile in the first place would hardly be an expression of faith in Jesus, who was unwavering, faithful to God the Father. So God is expecting us to be faithful in our liberty because our love and our devotion to him. Jesus' faithfulness was expressed in his loving service for others. His followers are compelled to exercise Christian liberty in the same way, by love serving one another. To do otherwise would be to provide an occasion to the flesh. The term translated occasion suggests something like a base of operation. Don't give the flesh a base of operation in which it can do things. We should consider how Paul uses the word flesh here. In some, in some places, he used this word to refer to the physical body, Romans 4 and 1. In other places, he uses this word to refer to unholy physical desires, Ephesians 2 and 3. But here, the focus seems to be on perspective that is entirely self-centered, not acknowledging God's rule or others' significance. I'm free. It's almost like a young person turning 18 or 21. He said, I'm free. I can do anything I want to do. All right. You still got responsibilities. You still have obligations. And the truth is, as long as you have to live under somebody else's house and somebody else has to pay the bills, you're really not free. Amen. Freedom means getting out there and getting it for yourself with the help of God. So he's saying that the flesh, the flesh is too self-centered. The, the flesh don't want to acknowledge God's rule or even the rule of law. Verse 14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the second commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Many Jewish teachers, including Jesus and Paul, saw the entire law of Moses as pointing to two great obligations. To love God and to love others. Because the Galatian churches face division, Paul emphasizes loving others as the law's focus. If motivated by their love for God, as revealed in Jesus, the Galatian Christians could love one another despite long-standing division of their respective heritage. Verse 15 says, but if ye bite and devour one another, Take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So the alternative to the love just described was self-defeating division. And that's what division is, you all. It's self-defeating in a home, 
in a family, in a church, in a business. Division is self. Each side attack the other. Like flesh eating animals in such a conflict, both sides would be wounded or eaten up. In the Cold War that followed World War II, the United States had a policy of nuclear deterrence known as mutual assured destruction, appropriately known as MAD for short. It, was in, it would indeed be MAD for the Galatians to undercut one another, since that would only result in mutual destruction. And let me, whenever churches are, Whenever denominations uh, are, are conflicting or, or, or battling one another over ideologies, a theology, a philosophy, and they're not letting the gospel of Jesus Christ be their primary driving instrument, they create a division. And that division, yes, affects the church, but I believe it has more impact on the world and the non-believers and those that will never be believers because of the conduct that they see going on among the so-called believer. We might wonder whether a solution would be for the Galatian churches to divide into the Jewish and the all Gentile congregations. For Paul, such a division was unthinkable. They needed to learn to live together and to love one another. The singularity of the gospel and of God himself must be reflected in the unity of his people. A divided church would be a devoured church. The two groups had to come to terms with the truth that they both belong to God's people through their faith in Jesus rather than through their obedience to the law of Moses. This did not mean ignoring their differences in background or in experience, but it did mean uniting across those differences with Christ-like love. Love can keep us together. Choosing God's side. Verse 16 says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But what can give the power to live such a life of loving service? The answer, Paul says, is what only faith in Jesus Christ provide. God's own spirit, the Holy Spirit. In Old Testament times, God had sent his spirit to a few individuals, notably the prophets who proclaimed his message authoritatively. But God has promised that in the age to come, he would pour out his spirit according to Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, pull out his spirit without that limit. But there normally were three categories of those who receive the spirit of God. Prophets, priests, and kings. But Joel said, he said in the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, all believers could thereby be empowered to live prophetically in the sense of their lives testifying to the true God and his rule over the world. With Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, that promise is fulfilled. Those who believe in Jesus as God's true king are promised that God's Holy Spirit will live within them. Thank you, Lord. Thereby, they are empowered to do what Israel had failed to do before. 
live genuinely. Live genuinely as God's people. Paul did not need to tell his readers to receive the spirit because they had already. But the spirit direction, the spirit power can be resisted. So the Galatians needed to be reminded to walk or to live. Walk always implies the lifestyle, living in the spirit. In so doing. In so doing, living in the spirit. You fulfill God's re will as summarized in the command to love. Such a life is the opposite of the life of the flesh. That is the life of sinful selfishness is the flesh style. The flesh provokes desire or lust, meaning not just sexual desire, but any selfish motivation. Listen to what verse 17. For the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would do because there's a war going on. These two sets of desires those of the flesh and of the spirit are fundamentally opposed to each other. And we're either motivated by our self-interest or filled with the Holy Spirit who directs us toward Christ-likeness, loving service for others. When you read Ephesians 5.18 says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. And when you're filled with the spirit, your desires are directed in a Christ-like loving service. Romans 6 through 8 offer Paul's own extended commentary on the phrase, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. What we truly want is to be God's people. What we truly want is to fulfill the purpose for which God created us. But the selfishness that pervades our hearts prevents that. However, we receive the power to become the people we desire to be. People who reflect God's holiness through the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Verse 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit. Ye are not under the law. Paul clarifies that there was nothing inherently wrong with the law and in, in and of itself, but the law of Moses did not have its limitations or it did rather have its limitations. It told us what was wrong. It told us what we shouldn't do. But the law really didn't offer salvation. That's another discussion. Oh, the Jewish constituents among Paul's original audience were especially challenged to shift their thoughts, shift their speech, and their behavior toward a life directed by the Spirit. Rejecting selfishness. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. For purposes of contrast, Paul reminded his readers what life in the flesh, the self-ruled life, was like as he began what we call the vice list. There are many such lists in Paul's letters. We should keep in mind However, that even collecting all the vices from all of Paul's list would not include everything that could be named. For the list at hand, the vices fail in, 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 in four groupings across uh, the three verses 
But let me say that there's some vices going on now that didn't exist when Paul was around. And I, I, I know that can be debated because they ain't nothing new under the sun. But, but let, let me just say this. There are some things going on now. Amen. That could be added to the vice list. Here's the first category. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 19b. These terms encompass all forms of sexual activity that occur outside of marriage relationship. In addition to hurting others, these acts also harm the guilty person. Uncleanness speaks to guilt through such activity. Lasciviousness refers to behavior that is shocking to public decency. Even cultures far from godly standards uphold some standards of sexual propriety. But a life of selfishness will find a way to shock any society. Life in the Holy Spirit is directed, uh, directly opposed to the life of flagrant sexual sins. You can read 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. Idolatry, verse 20. Idolatry, witchcraft. The list then shifts the focus to false religious practices. Idolatry exalts the created above the creator, reducing God to something much less than he is. Witchcraft isn't the attempt to use physical objects and rituals to manipulate the spiritual world. Verse 20b, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Paul lists attitudes and actions that work against self sacrificial love, threatening the church's unity. Hatred refers to hostility toward those we identify as enemies. Variance is division, making difference greater rather than seeking to overcome them. Emulations are strong passions that resent the success of others. Wrath refers to strong anger. God's wrath is the expression of his holiness against human evil. But human anger is often driven not by holiness, but by selfishness. Strife is the forming of mutual hostile groups to advance selfish interests. Seditions intensify that unholy tendencies. Heresies later became a term for false beliefs accepted by some Christians. But here it is another expression for hostile division and partnership. Then envying, murders, envying and murders, and murders conclude the group of sin of selfishness these two refer to the desire to deprive others of what they have, even life itself. Drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Paul concludes with two terms that represent public displays of self-destructiveness produced by selfishness, drunkenness, or intoxication from alcohol. Suggests individual self-destruction. Drunkenness is part of the wild party-like atmosphere of reveling. A context which includes unrestrained immorality. Unrestrained immorality. What are the deadly consequences? Verse 21 C of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you walk in that, 
lifestyle. If that becomes your lifestyle, he's not saying you've done it and, and you're no longer involved in it. He, he's not talking about people that have, have been involved and they've left it alone, they've moved on. He, he's talking about those that have it as a lifestyle shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All these evils are contrary to the kingdom of God. That is to the reign of God brought about by Christ. Now the now and in eternity. If these behaviors had become the mode of the Galatian lives, woke, they should themselves, or they showed themselves to have returned to rebellion against God's rule. Those whose lives are characterized by these vices would have no eternal inheritance except the death that is spoken of in Revelation 22, verses 14 and 15. Pursuing godliness is, your own, is where we need to be. A list of life. And this ought to be your list. But the fruit of the spirit. And again, these are categorized. They are, they are three to each list. Amen. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't say fruits. They, it says fruit. It's one. It's described in nine different identities, but it's one lifestyle. The fruit, the fruit of the spirit stands in sharp contrast to the work of the flesh. The word fruit is an apt term because like a farmer who plants a crop and reaps a harvest, what the Holy Spirit produces is what God seeks in his people. Since Paul's focus is on doing good toward others, perhaps this is why the word fruit is singular. All these characteristics belong together as one fruit, not many fruits. Though they are nine, they all belong in a spirit-controlled life as one fruit. Uh, all, all right. Well, as with the previous list, this list groups similar characteristics. Begins with the three foundations. Aspect of Christ's followers' character. Love, joy, and peace. Foundation. As followers of Christ, we should have love. We should have joy. And we should have peace. Which means there's something wrong if a follower of Christ has love. And they don't have joy. And they don't have peace. That, it, that they're missing elements that should be going together. And here's what it is. You need the Holy Spirit. You need to yield more to the Spirit. So that this characteristics, these, this character of love, joy, and peace be upon every believer in Christ. Hallelujah. The kind of love Paul has in mind is not conditioned on how deserving of love the other person is. You know, we call it agape, a godlike love. Rather, the kind of love in view flows from grace that blesses the underserving. It is the kind of love that God demonstrates toward us in John 3, 16. Joy is an inner disposition of well-being. External circumstances don't always dictate joy. It's an internal. It's an internal. 
disposition. But it's expressed outwardly. I'm talking about the joy that we should have. It always expressed outwardly and shared with others. The word peace reminds us of Old Testament statements about the peace that God granted his people. More than the end of hostility, the cessation of hostility, such peace means positive goodwill and fellowship. As God has made whole our relationship with him, his spirit empowers us to make relationships whole with others. Long suffering, verse 22b, gentleness and goodness. Second grouping consists of characteristics that undergird relationships. Long suffering is patience regarding the failings of others, including wrong that others commit. As God is patient with us, his spirit empowers our patience toward others. Gentleness names the attitude that seek to do positive good to others in all circumstances. It serves to nurture and protect others. Again, because God treats his people in this way. His spirit enables them to treat others likewise. Goodness further develops the idea of gentleness, putting the attitude into action. Those empowered by the spirit do not simply want the good. They actually do good things for others. The spirit compels us to be loyal to fellow Christians, committed to their welfare, no matter what. And finally, our list takes us, verse 22c and 23, <laughs> excuse me, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such, there is no law. The list concludes with three characteristics that are to undergird all the believer's actions. Faith in this context refers to willingness to practice without fail what one believes. As God has been devoted and persistent to fulfill the promises that he has made, so also his spirit empowers us to be persistently devoted. The second feature undergirding spirit-filled action is meekness. The meek do not seek to assert rights or privileges. Christ emptied himself of privilege. In becoming human, so also do those empowered by his spirit. Meekness. Jesus was meek. And there's a misunderstanding of meekness. It's often misunderstood to mean weakness. But because a person is meek, because a person is concerned about others' positions and others' a, a, a relationship, and they don't try to overassert themselves, don't mistake it for weakness. Jesus had to demonstrate in the flesh that he was not only meek, but he was not weak. And then the word translated temperance is also with variations. If it refers to the ability to keep desires in check. We, we, use, the, we use the terminology self-control. Paul uses here temperance. This was characteristic admired in Paul's time, but not widely practiced. 
the Galatian Christians could be criticized by their Jewish neighbors for abandoning the law of Moses and by their pagan neighbors for abandoning the custom of pagan worship. But Paul reminds them, but if they live as the spirit direct, they will produce a fruit that no law, Jewish or Roman, stands against and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Believers in Christ are joined to him in his death and so are raised with him to a new life. This does not mean that our old desires and our old habits disappear instantly. But it means that over time, the spirit replaces them with Christ-likeness. This requires our cooperation to assure that the old life remains dead and buried. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. The new life the Galatians had in Christ carried an obligation to put that life into practice. The phrase walk in the spirit could be translated, get in line with the spirit. It means deliberately reordering our lives to reflect what God has done. It is bearing the fruit of the spirit as routine practice, not some exceptional thing that you accomplish once a year, but it ought to become as you live longer and draw nearer and closer to God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is magnified in your life, it ought to be a routine. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. The Spirit worked can be destroyed easily by persistent selfishness. The key characteristic of the life of the flesh, selfishness. If Paul's original audience chose to seek attention for themselves, then the result would be a disregard and disrespect for others. That would destroy the fellowship that the Spirit sought to build. Christians are saved by a Lord who was worthy of the glory, who was worthy of the honor, but he chose lowliness to serve others. Philippians 2, 1 through 11 said that he did not think anything wrong with him lowering himself so that he could come down and win others. Following his way by the Spirit's power directs the Christian to a better way through loving others. Brother Superintendent, that's what I have on our lesson tonight. Now, you need to get up on your feet right here, because instead of complaining,